think over the break, uh, lunch and just now, a number of you have asked me, how do I understand this simple and related to this event? Uh, I think, as I said, I try not to attach the same thing. You ask me a lot of things, I'll tell you I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> just like what I said last night, if you come here, ask you want to tell me, tell you what this one represents, this one means this, this one means this. I told you last, I was joking with you last night. Uh. You had to ask money back from Grace. Uh. <laughs> because people, I, I don't. The reason I don't do it because, as I always say, that what is important for us is what is revelation inside of us. Because the minute we attach, whether it's literal, it's symbolic, sometimes we, it may distract us from seeing revelation. What is that message for us? So I know that whether it is symbolic, whether it's literal, what, how we read millennium, at the bottom line, we must be clear what Revelation is saying for us. Uh, that's what I'm trying to say. Uh, so, so what I'm trying to do is that let's read the Bible and hear what the scripture is saying before we start saying this is mean this, this means that. I'm not saying that there are some people who interpret that way. Whether it's right or wrong, I'm not saying that. You know? But what I'm saying is that let's hear what Revelation is saying to us. Uh, that would be my approach for, for this two days. So that once we get the message of revelation, whatever schema or interpretation, to me, is less important because we, we, we don't lose sight of the main message that revelation has uh, for us. Okay, let's turn to chapter 12. Now, oh, chapter 12, when you come to chapter 12, there's another Tunggu Sementa. This is a longer Tunggu Sementa. It has a few signs that were given from heaven. The first is about a pregnant woman and a, a red dragon that is pursuing this woman and this dragon was, named, was labeled as the devil called Satan. Now, when we come to chapter 12, this woman, let's read chapter 12 verse 1, and a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains, and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven, Behold a great, great dragon, with seven heads and seven horns on his head, seven diadems. He still swept down a third of the stars of heaven, and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore a child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, but, the, but her child was called up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she had a place prepared by God, for which she is to be nourished for one, two, six, four days, again, for three and a half years. Now, war arose in heaven. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ has come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of the testimony. For they, are loved, for they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, for you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea. For the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. Then suddenly you have these two images of the woman and, uh, and the dragon. Now traditionally, uh, there's a lot of interpretation about who this woman and who this child was. And some would think that this is talking about Mary and Jesus. Uh, but as I said, I will refrain from attaching any uh, references. But what we know for sure is that there is this war that goes on between this woman and the dragon. And whatever that the dragon tried to do with this woman, we know for sure that his days are limited. His days are limited. And when you come to chapter 7 from verse 7 to verse 12, it tells us that his time is short. Now, this again, you see, like you read Ratchet, it's like, 
go back, go forward. It's like this is like an image of what is going to what Revelation is going to talk about in chapter 19, 20, 21, 22. So you see sometimes there's a moving forward, there is a flashing back. And so sometimes it takes us hard to understand where Revelation is going. And that's why I say this kind of cycle, sometimes it moves back, it moves forward, move back, forward. So it's all in Revelation. But if you can try to understand that, I think it, it, it helps us uh, understand the flow and the framework. And then when you move on to chapter 13, suddenly you see the two picture of these two beasts arise. The first beast fought against God and the saints. Uh, if you look at chapter 13, a beast rising up from the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on his horns and Baphomius name on his head. And, and so this beast fought against God and the saints. And then when you move on, Further down, there is a second beast from verse 11 onwards. And this second beast caused people to worship the first beast with signs of the mark of, ah, the famous 666. On the right hand and the forehead. Uh, by the way, we don't know, there are some ministries that have the word 616, not even 666. Right? But the whole point is this, we talk about 666, we know that 666 is less perfect than 777, which is perfect number. Now, why is it that this place has a sign on the right hand and the forehead? Now, if you're a Jew who lived in the first century, when you hear these words, you automatically think of what the law of Moses said about the Shema. Now, if you remember the Shema that's found in Deuteronomy, uh, chapter 6. So when you read at Deuteronomy chapter 6, you see straight away where uh, the Shema was saying. Now let me read to you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Learn the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and your kids. So if you're a Jew, uh, you will automatically remember what the Shema says. Write them here, write them here. So it's not the it's the Shema that you have to remember. What is the Shema? Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Which means it goes back to acknowledging God and worshipping God, which is the overall action theme of revelation. Anything falls short of that is the mark of the beast. Now what this is 666? I think there's a lot of uh, theories out there. Uh, whatever it is, let's not forget that it is not about the Shema. Shema that we should write on our forehead and on our head is to worship God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. Anything short of that is the mark of the face, whatever that may be. Okay? Now, so if you look at Revelation 12 and 14 together, right, you have the woman and the dragon fighting this war. You have the beast and the saints fighting this war. The first beast, the second beast. So there is this war that is going on. The devil pursues the saints. The beast declare war and forces the saints to worship him. So when you come to chapter 12, 13, you see this power struggle. The woman with be pregnant with the child, being pursued by the dragon. Right? And then the first beast and the second beast forcing uh, the people to worship the first beast. So you have all this image. So what you can see in this two chapter is there is a very clear contestation of power now going on, trying to lure the people of God away from worshiping God. Now, if you put at this in the bigger picture in mind, then you can see why where the six 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 comes in. It is short of the Shema. Here, O Israel, the Lord your God is what there is only one God, and the Lord your God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all the heart, soul, and mind. So the question is, when this battle intensify, who will win this battle? Then the 
the same moves to Revelation chapter 14. John says, Then I looked and behold, Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. Now, when you think about this 144000, what comes to your mind? Earlier on, right? Chapter 7, you have encountered this number already. So, you see, there is moving forward, back a bit, moving forward. So, Revelation is like that. Now, so, you can understand there's a moving forward, backward trend, you see. Okay? Then, what happened? Verse 2. And I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was the sound of harpies playing on their harps, and they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the one four four zero 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 hundred forty four thousand but the redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women for their virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They have been redeemed from mankind as first fruit for God and the Lamb. And in their mouth no line was found, for they are blameless. So, John saw the vision. Even before the battle intensified, he saw a vision of people worshipping God. Then verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying directly over him with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God, give Him glory, because the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, and the sea and the spring of water. Then came another angel, and he said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She will make all nations drink the wine of the passion of a sexual immorality. Then come a third angel with a loud voice. Anyone worship the beast and his image and receive a mark on his forehead or his hand, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath. Fall full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Now, what is happening here? If you if you if I can go back you see chapter 11 and 12, the woman and the dragon and the beast, they're all fighting. Who wins? Then suddenly, the image moved to heaven where the saints sing a new song. Then he leaves us with the impression that, and what is happening to all this battle? Who's going to win? Uh, the devil and the force of evil have yet to conquer the redeemed because there are still many people that are singing a new song to the Lord. So before you come to answer who wins the battle, don't forget there are people who have not bowed down to the beast to worship him. So in other words, if you took Revelation 11, 12, 13, and 12, 13, 14 together, even though it seems to show that the evil seems to be so powerful that it's going to overcome you already, it may for a moment. There are many more in heaven worshipping God with a new song. And these are the people who have not defiled themselves. Then suddenly the scene moved. Hey, there are three angels now saying a few things important. The first angel said, Fear God, give Him glory for the hour of His judgment has come. Worship Him. Then the second angel said, Fallen, fallen, Babylon is fallen. Now this is what I meant by revelation going forward and backward. Where is Babylon fallen? And this is only in chapter 14. It's not only until we come to chapter 19 we see baby God is fallen. So you, you see all this image, something, it gives you a glimpse what is forward, it, it draws you backwards again, then you move forward, it gives you forward, again it goes backwards. So that's why I say revelation is not simply a linear thing because it moves you forward, backward, forward, backward. So if you understand this, then it's easier for us to understand the whole message of revelation. Then the third angel comes in. And say, those who worship the beast, right, are like those 144,000 that worship God that have not defiled themselves. Those who worship the beast, they will drink the wine of God's wrath. And this points forward to Revelation chapter 20. It talks about the judgment. So, 
Here you get a glimpse of what is to come already. But tunggu sebentar, tunggu sebentar, not yet. So that's that's why in you read Revelation, uh, just remember tunggu sebentar. <laughs> tunggu sebentar. And then after the three angels, this is followed in verse 12 and 13. There's a call for endurance of the saints. Those who keep the commandments of God and hold fast to the faith of Jesus. So again, the message of steadfastness comes in. Then the sea changes again. Then suddenly there's a harvest on earth, the Son of Man and his, and his three angels. There are two harvest imagery. The first is the reaping of wheat. Right? Now this reaping of wheat is fully ripe and there's a weeping of it and then suddenly there's a second harvest the second harvest is is the harvest of the grapes that are ripe but this grapes that are ripe are not to be used for wine they are being trodden outside the city and the blood flowed from the wine press one is a positive image of the harvest one is a negative one so what is this pointing to? It gives us a focus of what is going to come in Revelation 19, 20, 21, 22. And the final question is, it gives you a glimpse of picture. Now who do you want to follow? This beast is, go back to Revelation 12, 13, right? This beast is following, is persuading you away from God to worship Satan. Who will you follow? You follow the beast, you know the consequences. If you follow God, you also know the consequences. So before the answer is given, in this battle, who wins? Think for a moment, stop back, reflect. Who will you choose in your worship? You see where revelation is going? So it's always at the end, it's who will you worship? Who will you pledge your allegiance to? Are you going to follow the land or are you going to follow the beast? Make up your mind. You see, there is this sort of movement. Now, this is just a broad overview. So if you can put this broad overview idea back into Revelation and read it again, see whether you see the flow of the message. And then with this comes chapter 15. Now chapter 15 is actually very interesting because chapter 15 gives you an introduction to the seven points that you're going to see in the seven bowls that you release shortly. Let's read chapter 15. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels, seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is finished. And I saw what happened to be a sea of glass filled with fire. And so those who had conquered the beast and his image and the number of his name, standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands, and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O God, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous act has been revealed. Before the seven bowls are revealed, worship God first. See, you see the pattern in Revelation now? The other days I look, and the sanctuary of the tents of witness in heaven was opened. And out of the sanctuaries came the seven angels with the seven plates clothed in pure bright linen with golden sashes around their chest, and one of the four living creatures came to the seven angels, seven golden bowls, full of wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the sanctuary is filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power. And no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plates of the seven angels were finished. And so here, we have the seven bowls. And if you look at the seven bowls, you see, the wrath of God intensified in the wider scale. The trumpet, one third, now you see, it covered the whole world really with increased evil. So you see from the seal, it goes to the trumpet, trumpet covers one third, one third, one third, one third, right, of creation. Then you come to the seventh bowl, it covers the whole creation. So you see, there is a progression from the seal to the trumpet to the bowl. And then again, we have the 
four volts, the fifth and the sixth, and then finally when the seven, it is done. So if you follow this, right, the first seal, one, two, three, four, five, six, tunggu sebentar, seven buka, eh, no judgment. One, two, three, four, chamfer, five, six, tunggu sebentar, when the seven open, eh, no judgment yet. Suddenly you have all this war that goes on, and the question is, who will win? Yes, we know God will win, we know Babylon is better, but nothing happened yet. Tunggu sebentar. Then, the seven holes. At the end of the seven holes, it is done. Babylon is finished. So you see how it flows from the seal to the trumpet to the bowl. And so here, let's look at the bowls. Chapter 16. When I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the rock of God. So again, you are the team of judgment. Not the seals of judgment, the trumpets of judgment. The bowl is the same thing as well, judgment. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and harmful and painful, painful souls came upon the people before who bore the mark of the beast and worship image. First bowl. Then the second pour out the second bowl to the sea. The first is on the earth, the second is the sea, right? You see, there was a repetition of the seven trumpets, right? It's a seven trumpets, yeah. And it became like the blood of a corpse, and every living thing died that was in the sea. And the third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the spring of waters, and they become blood. And I heard the angel in charge of the water say, Just are you, O Holy One, who is and who was, for you brought this judgment, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you gave them blood to drink, it is what they deserve. And I heard the altar say, Yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgment. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and he was allowed to scorch people with fire, and they were scorched by the fierce heat, and they cursed the name of God who had power over this place. They did not repent and give him glory. So if you see, you see the parable, and the parable, the earth, the sea, the rivers, and then the sky. It's the same parable with the four, first four trumpets, right? talk about the earth, the sea, the rivers, and the sky, the whole creation. So if you look at it, you can see that it's still close to the road. That's why when you have this parallel pattern, you already know what the author was trying to tell us. It's a parallel pattern in the cycle. And bowl number four, no repentance. Let us move on. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in anguish and cursed the God of heaven for their pain and sorrow. They did not repent of their deeds. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and his water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings of the beast. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the poor prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs, for they are demonic spirits performing signs to go abroad to the kings of the whole earth, and assemble them for the battle on the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be exposed. And he assembled there the place that the Hebrew is called Amenabon. So you see how, how things is moving now? Uh, let me backtrack a bit. One, two, three, four bowls, right? You can see uh, the earth, the sea, the rivers, the sky. The people do not repent. No repentance used to come on the sixth seal, the sixth trumpet, right? Now here the fourth will tell you no repent. The fifth bowl, no repentance again. The sixth one, it's time for battle already. And where did they meet? At Amandadon or Mount of Megiddo. Now, Megiddo is a place in northern Israel today. Now, historically, if you look at it briefly, this is a place where all the kings who go to battle met their judgment there. They find their defeat there. 
Farah and Deborah defeated the Canaanites. Here in Mount Megiddo, Jehu killed Ahaziah here in Megiddo. The Egyptian king King Josiah here in Megiddo. So Megiddo is like the crossroad in Israel where all the battles and all the civilization take place here. And if you go to Megiddo today, you can see this excavation site here. And every civilization, civilization that had a battle here, they built over it. And then defeated, built over it. So if you look at the model in this uh, in Megiddo, there are always this model, you can see all the different layers of the name. Historically, everyone fight their battle in this place because it has important crossroad. You read this place, Mount Megiddo, you can see your surrounding areas. And so this is a place where battle is always take place. And this is where oh John he sees this vision of the last battle is going to fight here. This is battle that's going to be determine who wins, who goes. It's a final battle. And so here in in the sixth bowl, you see they are assembled here. Now things are getting more exciting now, right? Final war declared indeed. Who's going to win? Now before that, before the seven bowls were released, before even opening the seven trump, the, the first bowl were released, at the blow of the seven trumpet, we only get a glimpse of the woman and the dragon, the two beasts pursuing the same. So it's like giving you a four cases what is going to come here when the seven bowl is going to be opened. Here, the battle of Magadon is announced. The final battle is going to take place. You see how everything builds up to the climax and what will happen. Let's read the seven book, verse 17, chapter 16. The seventh angel poured out his bow into the air, and a loud voice came out from the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, fields of thunder and a great earthquake, such as there had never been since man was on earth. So great was that earthquake. That great city was split into three parts, and the cities of nations fell, and God remembered that they longed the great to make her drink the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. And every island fled the great, and no mountains were to be found. And great hailstones, about hundred pounds each, fell from heaven on people, and they cursed God for the plagues of the hail because the plague was so severe. And come to the seventh bowl, it just it is done. Babylon has fallen. God remember the great Babylon, and it has fallen. But interestingly. The detailed description of fall may belong to Tungus of Benta, chapter 19. So you see, Grandpa Shaili, Tungus of Benta, worship God, Tungus of Benta, worship God, Tungus of Benta. And you can see all those things. And here, how has they belong to all of them? for a while, and now, Babylon is revealed to us. Chapter 17. Chapter 8, chapter 17, 18, 19, talk about the fall of uh, Babylon. In two visions. First, he is the great prostitute and the base. And chapter 6 says, Babylon, the great mother of wars and of earth and population, and the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. It will fall and it has fallen. Then we go to chapter 18. It's still, I mentioned chapter 19, Paul belongs to chapter 18. Chapter 18 is the fall of Babylon, not 19. When you come to chapter 18, you see the fall of Babylon. And then the way we describe the fall of Babylon, there are a number of voices that cry out the fall of Babylon. Chapter 18, verse 2, it's the first boy that says, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for, of every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. For all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of the sexual immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of a luxurious living. Fallen is Babylon the Great. 
the velocity is so great it has fallen. And then the second voice came, come out of her, my people. There's no hope. Lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues, for her sins are hit high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Pay her back as she herself has paid back others, and repay her double for her deeds. Makes a double portion for her in the cup she makes, as she glorified herself and lived in luxury. So give her a life, a, a, a light measure of torment and mourning. Since in her heart she says, I sit as a queen, I'm no widow, and mourning I shall never see. For this reason, her flesh shall come in a single day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire. For mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. Come out, my people, have nothing to do with Babylon. You think Babylon is great? Let me tell you, she has met her match. The Lord God is far more mighty. As we move further on, when Babylon is fallen, there are then laments by various groups of people. The kings, in verse 9 to 11, cry out, Alas, Alas, the great city Babylon, the mighty city, for in one hour, the judgment has come. So short, so fast, and fall. Then the merchants also cry out, I was, I was the great city, clothed in fine linen, with purple and scarlet, adorned with gold, with jewels, with pearls. In one hour, uh, one hour all this wealth has been laid away when God's judge who can run. The king also cry out, the merchants also cry out. Bear in mind, huh? this group of people, right, is the same group of people in the sixth seal who run and hide in the cave and say, who shall save us from uh, we want to see God's face, right? They refuse to repent. And you look at the sixth trumpet, you look at the gold, baby Lord, all the people that is within that is within her that refuse to repent. And now they cry out. In one hour the king said, Hey, the city is gone. The merchant have accumulated so much wealth. In one hour everything is gone. And not only that, the shipmaster and the seafarers. Alas, Alas, the great city where all who had sheep and sea grew rich by the well. In one hour, everything has been laid place. Then comes a third voice. The third voice says, With such violence, Babylon, the great city, will be choked down and will be found no more. You think you are great, the instance of the second judgment has come and Babylon has managed the judgment. The only thing you can be sure about Babylon, read in the life of first century, is that if you read the writings of Peter, Babylon has often been used to refer to the Roman Empire. That's what we know. But that doesn't mean Babylon has only one reference. If you think about application, who is this Babylon now meets today? So the question for us is, who do we pledge our allegiance to? Caesar, Babylon, or to God? When Babylon has heaven, we move to chapter 19. There's a series of hallelujah, again, worship. There's worship in heaven. There are four hallelujahs. And the first one we see is salvation and glory. Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power to our God. For his judgment are just and true. He has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged on her the blood of all his servants. God has vindicated his people finally. The second hallelujah. The smokes go up to her forever and ever. Hallelujah. And then there is a third hallelujah. Amen. Praise your God. Uh, you, his servant, and all who fear him, great and small. Hallelujah. And then the final fourth hallelujah in chapter 19. Hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns, so rejoice and exalt and give him the glory. For the marriage of the land has come. His bride has made herself ready. To her, he has been granted to be clothed with fine linen, bright and pure. 
for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And so when you come to chapter 19, here in the first half, the angel said to John, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. And I fell down his feet to worship him, but the angel said to me, You must not do that, I am a fellow servant with you and your comrades who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. Again, you see the whole idea of worship God. So if you follow the seals, the trumpets, the bow, it all points to one thing, the final judgment of God. You look at the seals, judgment will come to lose the time. You look for the seven trumpets, judgment's going to come. Tunggu lagi, things are getting darker now, I know. When you look at the seven bowls, things are getting darker and darker. And finally, when the seven bowl comes to the picture, it is done. Babylon has fallen, and Babylon has fallen. All the kings, all the merchants, all the sea masters, sea fairies, all cry out, Atlas, Atlas, why so fast? You? Babylon, they have fallen. And then the scenes move to chapter 19. There was great hallelujah that worship God in heaven. Again, the theme of worship comes up. Now when you move to chapter 19, the rest of chapter 19, 20, 21, and 22, you see the judgment of God. Here the theme, the judgment is finally here. The rider of the white horse is bringing judgment. And then, that is the idea of the millennium, Revelation chapter 20, just a few verses, and caused so much theological con controversy, what to do with this idea of millennium. Is it pre-new, a-new, post-new, whatever new, uh, whether literal 1,000 or symbolic, just a few verses only, you know, divide denominations, and, and you have denomination put it into that statement of faith, we believe in the pre-millennium coming of Lord Jesus Christ, and so on. We see all those things, you know, millennium only. But in this millennium, we know that Satan is binded for the last, for the limited time. There will be a reign of the saints, where Satan is going to be released for the final, final battle, where there will be a great white throne judgment, where God will triumph finally. And then there will be finally, there will be new heaven and new heaven. So when you, when you see how things move forward, the seals, the trumpets, the bowls, they all point to one thing. God will ultimately triumph over all evil so worship him. That is where all this series of seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowl is bringing this revelation to the ultimate climax. Now before we look at a bit greater in Revelation 19, 20 and 21, probably we could sing one game get ourselves stretched a bit, one hymn. There are two more hymns to sing. Right? Let's sing this hymn, A Love, Divine Love, and Seven. Let us stand. Okay, can I? So this is a cry, just a, just a cry for people who have been following the revelation. They have gone through, like what we say, we start from the letters to the seven churches. We look at how some of them have been some have gone through trials and difficulties. Then it takes us into heaven to see God and Christ being exalted high and lifted up and we are to worship Him and Him only, God only. And then we see the seventh seal. God's judgment is coming, but the people will not repent. The most of the night, praise in heaven, you know. And the seven trumpets, things are getting darker but the people still will not repent. Then comes the seven bowls. Things are getting darker and darker and darker. The people still refuse to repent. And then a final battle is being staged. Finally, it is done. Babylon is fallen and everybody lament for its downfall. And yet the saints are crying out, Hallelujah, 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 series of four Hallelujahs. And then the scene moved. Finally, judgment is here. Now, as we read Revelation, the second half of Revelation 19 onwards, we see judgment is here. 
the white horse and his rider. And let's look at Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head a money diadem, for he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe deep in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, which was with which to strike down the nation, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress and the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and his tie, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So suddenly, the judgment is here, and this white horse has a number of names. He's faithful and true. He has a name that is written that no one knows but himself. He is called the Word of God, and he is a King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And then, he turned to a supper scene. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun with loud voice. He called to all the birds that fly directly over him, Come gather for the great supper of God, to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both great and small. And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured within the false prophet, who in his presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were slain by the sword that came out from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all his birds were gorged with their flesh. Now this is a very interesting supper image to see. When you think about supper, you always think that it's going to feast, that going to celebration. But this supper that Revelation 19 talks about is a very unsavory supper. Not a very nice image that you, you talk about eating the flesh of all the different groups of people here. A very gory thing. But Edward Eller has this to say. I find his quote very interesting. That's why I put it here. I said, you have your choice. Who are you going to worship, right? Either you can go to the Lamb's Supper as guests, friends of the bride, and then you can really enjoy the great supper, or you could go to this other supper as part of the menu. So for those who refuse to worship God, you go to the supper and you are the menu for all the birds in the air to eat. Very gory image. But if you know who you have chosen to serve, you will join in the true marriage supper of the Lamb when you go to the feast. So decide. You want to be the guest or you want to be part of the menu? You decide. <laughs> so I thought, I thought that Ella has a beautiful way of summarizing what this gory supper is all about. And then when you come to chapter 20, as I said earlier, there's so much theological debates on these six verses about the whole view of millennium. Okay. Whatever views that we take, I think to me is secondary, but what is important is that this marks the end of Satan and the vindication of the saints and the reign of God. Let's not lose sight of that. Sometimes we fight and fight over a new or a premium, whatever, and the commitment that whatever you view we hold on to, let us not lose sight that this marks the end of Satan, the vindication of the saints that were martyred, who are faithful to God, and the reign of Christ. Let's not miss that. And this is what this space uh, was saying. That in this chapter, Satan was bound for a short while while the martyrs were being mitigated. Then subsequently, Satan will be released and there will be a final battle where his eternal destiny is determined. Lake of fire and sulfur. And finally, the rising of the dead and the final judgment before the great white throne of God will take place when the book of life will be opened. 
eternal destiny for those who follow the Lamb. So when you look forward to Revelation, you can see that all throughout chapter 1, right up to chapter 20, you can see a recurring theme maybe, right? Worship God. Choose for the day who you will worship. Be faithful. Remain faithful until the end. Even if you suffer for a while, remain faithful because God is going to vindicate you. There will be the final judgment on everyone. Rest assured, God is sovereign. So to me, that gave me great assurance, a great hope that I can look forward to the coming of Jesus where God is going to bring history to an end. In a sense, the history of earth to an end where there will be a new heaven and a new earth where God will truly finally wipe away all tears and we will join the saints in worshipping God. That is the true hope that we have. And I hope and I pray that all of us were longing for the coming of Christ as well. So before we, we move forward to the, briefly to the last two chapters, I just want us to pause and think. If you look at Revelation, there's always this battle between the good and evil. Satan and his forces often draw us away from worshipping God. What are some specific ways that we think about us living in our world today could, that we could be faithful witness against all evil powers? What about judgment that will surely come one day? Let us be reminded that sometimes we want judgment to be done according to our time, according to our way, and we want it now. We say, we want it now, that is the best. But God tells us, Tunggu sebentar. It will surely come, not according to your time, but according to His time. Can we surrender that to God and rest assured that He is sovereign, He knows what is best, He will surely act. When He acts, as we have read in Revelation chapter 18, the king will say, Huh? Within half an hour, all have panels ready. Yeah. The, the rich people will say, Huh? Within one hour, everything gone ready. Yeah. God's timing is never one second too late or never one second too early is always perfect. And we can rest assured that God's timing is always, always perfect and He's sovereign and He will do it. That is the greatest hope we have. So, Revelation, when you come to chapter 21, 22, uh, before I go to chapter we can see the theme again. God is sovereign. The land is victorious. There will be a gathering of the community of the faithful. And there will be the rise and fall of evil forces. There will be the judgment of God. And finally, when we move on to the finale, John saw a vision, a new heaven and new earth. And Jesus, and, and with, with, the, uh, with the assurance, see, I am making all things new and it is done. I'll pick up this thing a little bit more tomorrow morning um, when I share in my sermon. So I'm not going to cover a bit, uh, a lot here since I'll be picking up some of those things tomorrow. And then there's a worship scene again. See, the home of God is among mortals. You will dwell with them as their God. They will be His people and God Himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. But the first thing has passed away. Again, this theme is nothing new because early on in Revelation, we have read that already, right? God will wipe away all tears. God will wipe away all tears. This is the reality now. And it is happening now. And then there will be a new city of Jerusalem. An interesting thing is, as you look at this city, John mentioned that, hey, there's no temple. True now, there's no new temple. The temple itself is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. And there's a river of life that flows through the city. And again, the idea of worship comes into the picture. But the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it. And His servants will worship Him. And they will see His face and His name will be on their foreheads. Not the mark of the face. Then it goes back to John. In Revelation chapter 22. 
And John wanted to worship this angel that gave him the answer. And the angel said, you must not do that, for I'm a fellow servant with you. And your comrades and the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book, just I want to try, John tried to do earlier on, and he's worshipping the angel. The message, messenger reminded him, worship God and God only. Then when we come to Revelation 22, there's this assurance that Jesus is coming back soon. And you read from verse 6 onward, you can see a number of times, I am coming back, I am coming soon, repeats itself. So again, this is a very important theme towards the end of Revelation. Jesus is coming soon. We do not know when. It could be today, it could be tomorrow, the next week, it could be next year. But the question is, are we ready to meet him? See, I am coming soon. My reward is with me to repay according to everyone's work. I am the Alpha Omega. Alpha is the first Greek letter. Omega is the last Greek letter. I'm beginning and the end. The first and the last. He will surely come. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And everyone who hears say, Come. And let everyone who is thirsty come. The invitation is still open for all. Today is a day of salvation. There's still time before the coming of the Lord. Will you come? Again, there is hope for those who have yet to hear the good news. Come. Let anyone who wishes to take the water of life as a gift, come. And Jesus again said, Surely I am coming soon. And the book of Revelation, verse 20 says, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. When will all these things happen? As we look to Revelation, as we look forward to the coming of Jesus. Revelation never tells us the answer. To be honest, I don't know. But one thing I know is that we must worship God for now and renounce all evils and idols and we must be ready and long for His coming. So in many ways, as you look forward to the last few words of Revelation, it is a hopeful book. Hopeful because Jesus is going to come back soon and God is going to make all things right. And because we know Jesus is going to come back soon, we do know when. It shaped the way we think and we live right now. As I go back to yesterday when I say, if we read Revelation, it help to shape and transform us the way we live right now. Are we complacent? Are we fearful of persecution? Are we compromising now? Remember the letters of seven churches? Have we lost our first love towards God and to humanity? Have we... Have we realized so much of our self-sufficiency until we move through God out of the picture and He is now standing at the door and knock? Come, I'm coming back soon. Let's get ready. And let's look forward to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And let's look forward to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, yes, I'm coming back soon. How would that affect the way we live our life today? How we could get ready? How are we going to make this decision in our life that we're going to worship God and Him and Him alone and no one else? How are we going to renounce all evil, renounce all idols in our lives? Get ready that Jesus is going to return soon and we simply do not know when. And when He comes, will He find us ready? Will He find us Faithful, would he find us compromising our faith? Would he find us declaring that Caesar is Lord? We can only pray to God that when he comes again, that he might find us faithful. And that as brothers and sisters in the community of faith, let us encourage one another spur one another up as we look forward to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ that we may look forward to His return and 
may we be found we're going to end by singing another great hymn okay? great Charles hymn by Charles Wesley that we have to sing Lord He comes with clouds descending I love this hymn simply because it goes back to Revelation chapter 1 verse 7 if I'm not wrong Lord He comes with clouds descending and yet at the same time He looks forward to the new creation yes He's going to come Lord come quickly and we have the privilege of Reverend King, that's going to lead us in singing uh, this hymn, Lo He Comes with Clouds Descending.